are here today to discuss the concerns about physical health in mm. schizophrenia. I'm here with Dr. Alex Mitchell to find out how large is this concern and does everybody recognise this problem? Mm. Well, we are increasingly aware of the importance of physical health comorbidity in schizophrenia. Comorbidity is a medical jargon word. It just means physical health occurring alongside a mental health problem. And for decades, we've known that there is a slight concern for patients with severe mental illness, but we weren't quite aware of the magnitude of that problem. The magnitude of the problem can be put into black and white terms by looking at the years of life lost, the years of life effectively robbed from the patient by virtue of miscellaneous physical problems in the background, excess mortality, you might call it. And that has been added up by various large studies around the world. For example, Westman et al. in uh, Finland and in the Scandinavian countries, Denmark as well. Um, they found that the premature mortality compared to the general population in schizophrenia was about 13 years lost in advance of the normal mortality rate. So those um, 13 years really have to be explained. What is going on for those patients that cause that premature mortality, um, which is really significant? To, to, to give you an idea on a kind of spectrum, that is more than the years of life lost in the population due to diabetes or due to stroke or due to cardiovascular disease. I'm not saying the number of deaths are more than those conditions. I'm saying the years of life lost personally, if you have that comorbidity, is um, more than if you had, for example, diabetes, stroke, or cardiovascular disease. So it really is a major area that we need to, to be doing more about. And would you say that medical care is, is better or worse than in schizophrenia? Well, medical care has been examined now in a number of studies. That's been a particular research interest area of this department. Medical care is quite complicated because it actually starts before patients are frankly unwell with the medical concern. What I mean by that is it starts with looking at screening techniques in the general population. For example, uh, one thing we've been looking at quite closely recently is um, screening for breast cancer with mammography. Now, there is an inequality in the receipt of mammography for women who have schizophrenia compared to women without schizophrenia in the general population. The magnitude of the difference is about 10%. Now, that 10% doesn't sound really that large until you think that there's about 1 million attendances for mammography in the UK per year. There's about 20 million in Europe, possibly more than that, and there's about 20 million in the US. That 10% difference can be converted into uh, a bad outcome because the person with schizophrenia is 10% more likely to miss their mammography screen. And that bad outcome is equivalent to 1,000 lives lost per year due to missed mammographies in Europe and 1,000 lives lost in the US due to mammography. So that slight difference in, on a population level can be converted into really a very worrying disparity which affects mortality. It's not just an academic finding. Now that's, that's about mass screening, but you said are there inequalities in medical care in general? It can also be thought about when somebody has a medical concern. For example, what happens when somebody with schizophrenia has a known cardiovascular disease? Let's take a serious one, a heart attack or myocardial infarction. What we found by looking at the literature is patients with schizophrenia are 50% um, less likely to receive a timely cardiovascular intervention procedure after a myocardial infarction. Um, that's a procedure like a coronary artery bypass graft, 50% less likely to receive it. Um, that again is a major, major concern. What, what is it that's explaining this disparity? We need to really look at that group in some detail to understand what's going on there. So really the medical care isn't satisfactory in a psychiatric setting as far as you can see? 
Well, that's actually in a medical setting. Right. In a psychiatric setting. Right. Those are patients who have been admitted for psychiatric reasons, and then their medical care is almost, I, I mean, this is an attitude issue, but it's almost considered a secondary issue. So if you have a barn door medical condition, you tend to come into a medical hospital. If you have a um, primary psychiatric disorder warranting admission, you're under psychiatric care. So the question you're raising there is, if you come under psychiatric care, is the medical care of the psychiatric patient adequate or inadequate? And there is a disparity, as you basically say, in that, in that arena too. That's actually measured by um, routine monitoring of medical issues. For example, how much are the staff scrutinizing the patients for their, let's say, weight, for their blood pressure, for their um, glucose, for their lipid profile, uh, for their smoking status, all of these, um, what is uncomfortably called, I don't like the term, but background lifestyle risk factors. All of those background risk factors contribute to cardiovascular and metabolic ill health. And that is basically what is explaining accelerated or advanced mortality, excess mortality in schizophrenia. So the question that I want to come back to there is in a psychiatric setting, Given the high concern of medical comorbidity, are we then monitoring to an adequate degree? And as you probably know, we've looked at this in some detail. Our paper on this came out in Psychological Medicine last year. And we found that um, really we're not monitoring up to scratch in most of those areas I just mentioned. For example, um, across the board, um, prior to very recent concerns about this area, only about 50% of people with a severe mental ill health diagnosis would receive a weight or a waist check to look at their weight status. So basically whether they're overweight. Um, but yet we know now that um, between 50% and two thirds in our meta-analysis are actually suffering um, over, from overweight or obesity as part of their condition. Some of that, unfortunately, is explained by the drugs that we use. So some of that is explained by, um, for example, antipsychotics, particularly the modern generation, which is called atypical antipsychotics. And an example would be olanzapine, but there are others, clozapine, and there's lots of other examples. Some of those drugs do definitely make weight uh, worse. And we can quantify it. The weight gain, if you are drug naive and starting on one of those medications over the first year on those medications is about um, two to three stone or about um, 12 to 15 kilos unless you take preparatory preventative measures to offset that. That would be a typical weight gain with those medications. So weight is a problem but yet we're not monitoring. Blood pressure is exactly the same story. If you look at blood pressure in patients with schizophrenia, the rate of hypertension is 40%, which is higher than the general population. Now, if you look at hypertension in the general population, um, half of hypertension in the general population goes untreated because it's often not present, presenting clinically with a really bond or a feature that uh, you know flags up to GPs, this is a problem. But, you know, it's picked up um, in some cases by screening that goes on in, in, in the GP surgery. What's the figure in um, schizophrenia, given the rate of hypertension is higher? Well, actually, the intervention rate is lower. The intervention rate is around 25%. So of all those with hypertension, about a quarter will get treatment if you have schizophrenia and hypertension, whereas a half will get treatment if you're in the general population with hypertension. A half isn't good enough either, but a quarter of those treated really isn't good enough. If you look at lipid profile, abnormal lipids, that's the same. If you look at diabetes, it's the same again. Um, only a small proportion get treated. So we have this odd situation where we have a high rate of medical comorbidities, including all these medical risk factors. And then we have a disproportionate low rate of treatment for those conditions. And that leaves the patient in a very awkward position. Would you say that everybody recognises these problems? Well, they're coming to attention of GPs in some cases. 
in uh, psychiatrists like I just outlined, and in some cases medical professionals. So the data suggests that each group is somewhat responsible for a failing. It's not that I as a psychiatrist can say, oh it's my GP colleagues that are failing this group, I just wish my GP colleagues would come up to scratch in this area. That's, that's way too simplistic. We all have a responsibility here. And if you look at the literature, there's evidence for us all failing in some ways. So we all have the responsibility and we all, in a way, um, need to improve in certain areas. And we need to give some serious thought about the mechanisms by which healthcare professionals can improve physical health monitoring. Some of it is actually about attitudes and a kind of culture shift. Let me, let me give you a couple of examples here. In my hospital, my, you know, my colleagues in, 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 in this trust are actually not monitoring very well. We have the national data comparing each hospital on physical healthcare monitoring. Um, and we are monitoring quite poorly. I flagged this concern to uh, my management colleagues and they nominated um, a chief nurse in the hospital to look after this problem. But I've tried again and again to f um, get the chief nurse to work with me on um, trying to resolve this problem. And really, it's been very hard work. There's a kind of belief that um, it's somebody else's problem. Another example is we, we published a paper um, on how medical uh, monitoring wasn't being done in psychiatric settings in general from the world literature, looking at all different um, countries. I sent this paper um, to my hospital and said, you know, we should really flag this as a, um, a concern that's likely to be um, the case locally and we could do something about it. In other words, we could use this as a... Um, lever to action, if you like. Their response, without mentioning any names, was we don't want to be um, involved in this work. We don't want to be mentioned in this work. We actually want to um, believe, without the evidence, that we're okay, but everyone else is failing. About a year or two later, it was proven that our hospital is actually doing really badly, but at that time we didn't know. But the press office said they didn't want to be involved. And that tells you that there's a culture problem regarding physical and mental health comorbidity. And sometimes, unless somebody comes along and says, this is the standard, what are you doing? And are you coming up to that standard? People, in some ways, often don't want to know. Or put it another way, they've got other priorities. And, and a, what's perceived as a secondary complication, in other words, a comorbidity, is sometimes considered to be somebody else's problem or not the, the biggest issue for today. So what you're really saying is that the medical care isn't satisfactory in a psychiatric setting? Yes, in a psychiatric setting and in a medical setting, and I haven't mentioned it in detail, but in a primary care setting it's also not satisfactory. Let me tell you the data that we've got from primary care just to complete the story. So there's one very large study of 100,000 primary care attendees, it's called the Thin uh, network database and David Osborne in London is the first author on that uh, and they showed that um, GP based monitoring of medical um, risk factors such as hypertension such as glucose dysregulation or lipids was poor for those with a mental health problem but this was before the um, so-called COF standards came out that means quality outcome framework and again that's just a jargon term meaning that there's um, the government setting a standard for GP colleagues to adhere to. So they have set a standard, and that standard includes weight monitoring, glucose monitoring, uh, lipid monitoring, and blood pressure monitoring. Um, the glucose monitoring is either directly random glucose, or more recently, um, a proxy marker of that, which is called HbA1c, which is basically glycosylated hemoglobin, which means how abnormal has your glucose been over a period of time, a few weeks. The beauty of that test is it doesn't have to be done fasting, by the way. So we've looked at um, this data, comparing the same standard, which, let me give you one, has the patient been monitored for their blood pressure in the last 15 months? That would be a typical standard. Has the patient been monitored in a period of time, which is set at 15 months? 
I, I, was, I was alerted to a possible concern or disparity in those with mental, um, severe mental illness by a colleague of mine in Northampton, Sheila Hardy. Sheila Hardy has been working on, with Richard Gray on an improvement program to help physical health concerns called um, Health Improvement Program. But she alerted me to a study that she'd done locally in Northampton, which found a really large disparity between monitoring of blood pressure, lipids, glucose, and weight in those with versus without mental ill health. And the clever thing she did is she used the same standard in schizophrenia versus the same standard in diabetes. Now, at the beginning of this discussion, I said that the mortality rates, the years of life lost, were more but they're in the same ballpark figure for schizophrenia as diabetes. And the prevalence of severe mental ill health in the general population is about three to five percent, which is about the same ballpark figure as diabetes. And the mortality from diabetes is in the same ballpark figure as the mortality from schizophrenia. And most of the years of life lost are not directly attributable to the condition, but attributable to cardiovascular ill health that background comorbidity, comorbidity we're talking about today. So she, she, she did a clever thing, which was compare the two standards. Now with Sheila's help, we approached the Department of Health and we then got the data for all practices through the whole country for 2012, which amounted to 8 million contacts in primary care. And it turned out that every one of those characteristic monitoring um, standards was poorer in schizophrenia than diabetes by some considerable margin. And to give you a ballpark on that, in, in schizophrenia, the standard for monitoring was adhered to roughly three quarters of the time. But in diabetes, it was adhered to 95% of the time. And that's having already accounted for people who don't attend. So we, there's, a, there's a classic argument here is, oh, when, when we hear this, it's, yes, of course, it's patients with schizophrenia who are not attending. Well, Sheila Hardy didn't find that in Northampton. And we also removed that from the data set when we look nationally. So these are of attendees. How many times were they adequately monitored? So what that tells you is there's disparity in monitoring in primary care. By the way, there is also a disparity in psychiatric settings, as we were alluding to before, and there's a disparity in medical settings. But it's wanting you to understand that there is a disparity also in primary care. So it's not necessarily the solution to just expect GPs to take up the slack in this area. We've all got that responsibility. As there's such a large concern, um, how can these problems be addressed in your opinion? Well, that is tricky because there's lots of standards in this area. For example, there's the new NICE guidelines in um, schizophrenia, which have just come out 20, February, February 2014, which have got enhanced um, physical health care monitoring built in to the NICE guidelines standards. So in a way, we should be seeing a culture shift. There's um, national um, guidelines which have actually been produced or actually a decade ago, would you believe, in, tw in uh, 2004, the first kind of series of guidelines came out about physical healthcare monitoring. And we did see a slight shift after, that mo after those guidelines in terms of actual frequency of monitoring in this area. So there, there was an improvement, but it still left most of these areas suboptimal. Let me give you an example. Well, we have pretty good standards in relation to smoking in this country and in others. Everybody knows it's a major concern. That's reflected in the general population rates of smoking coming under 20% in the US and the UK. So only one in five are current smokers. But it's an exact mirror image in some studies in severe mental illness. In schizophrenia, for example, in the second Australian psychosis um, study, which was run by Sherry Galletley and also David Castle and many other colleagues in Australia, they found that the rate of smoking in women with schizophrenia, current smoking, was 71%. So there's a very high rate of smoking. A new paper by um, Callahan and colleagues in Canada has just shown that the attributable risk contributing to mortality from smoking in schizophrenia is more than 50%. In fact, they showed 
of mortality in schizophrenia was due to excess smoking, was well, due to smoking and smoking related ill health. That compares to between 10 and 20% in the general population. So a very large portion of that excess mortality that we started talking about earlier is actually due to that headline, excess smoking rate. But what are we doing about smoking? In other words, are we advising our patients appropriately? Are we, are we, are we giving appropriate smoking cessation advice? Well, there's actually five studies comparing smoking cessation advice in those with severe mental illness versus without. And one of those studies from the US Duffy has um, found that there was a 30% lower um, likelihood of receiving smoking cessation advice. So, that what, so what does that mean altogether? We've got a very high rate of smoking. It contributes severely to mortality as well as poor um, general function. Yet we're not giving patients adequate advice in that area. We should be on the ball about this. We should be giving them more advice. We should be asking them to adhere to standards more, but not just idle recommendations, by actually helping them with smoking cessation techniques which are proven to be evidence-based. <laughs>